اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان اللعین الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم الحمد للہ رب العالمین والصلاة والسلام على خاتم الانبیاء والمرسلین سیدنا و نبینا محمد و علی اہل بیته الطیبین الطاہرین اللہم صلی اللہ علیہ وسلم ولعنت اللہ على اعدائهم و منکر فضائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Respected elders, brothers and sisters, السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Last year I conducted a lecture series called Musa and the Liberation of Bani Israel it was a series of 10 lectures where I analyzed the history of Bani Israel, looking at the Quranic descriptions of who they are. For instance, the Holy Quran speaks of Bani Israel as being the descendants of those who are on the ark with Noah. So I conducted the series and we looked at the Quranic verses related to the birth of Musa السلام, to his upbringing in the palace of Fir'aun and we spoke at length about the accidental killing of the Coptic and Musa السلام, fleeing Egypt as a fugitive and the Quran mentions that he ends up meeting one of the daughters of, he meets the daughters of Shu'aib. He ends up meeting Prophet Shu'aib alayhi salam. He spends about 10 years on the farm of Shu'aib. And after some time, he returns to Egypt and he encounters Fir'aun and ultimately he is able to release the children of Israel from captivity. In this series, what I want to do, I want to look at a different phase in the life of Musa and Bani Israel. Last year, we spoke about Musa السلام, from his birth up until the drowning of Fir'aun. But for many of us, we might not have a clear picture of what ensued, what happened after the drowning of Fir'aun. So when we look at the story of Musa السلام, and Bani Israel, we can essentially divide the life of Musa السلام, into two main periods. We have the period from his birth up until the drowning of Musa, and we can call this the pre-Exodus period, and by the Exodus we mean the, the mass departure of Bani Israel from ancient Egypt. So this is the first part of his life. And then you have Musa and Bani Israel after the drowning of Fir'aun, the post-Exodus period. Now, what is the difference between these two periods? You see, when you try to study the story of Musa السلام, in the Qur'an, the story of Musa is scattered throughout the Holy Qur'an. The story of Musa is not a linear narrative, as we see with the story of Yusuf السلام. What makes Surah Yusuf unique among the Qur'anic stories is that this is a story that is told from the beginning till the end. It's told in a chronological order. It's told in a linear fashion. Whereas the story of Musa السلام, in the Quran is not, it's not like that. It requires a lot of investigative work. You have to bring together these pieces of the puzzle to construct a complete picture. Now, I want to share a number of differences that we see between Musa and Bani Israel under Fir'aun 
and Musa and Bani Israel after the drowning of Pharaoh. So as I said, we'll call these two periods the pre-Exodus period and the post-Exodus period. Now one of the main differences between these two periods is that the nature of the enemy that Musa and Bani Israel are facing is quite different. When Musa and Bani Israel are in Egypt, the main enemy that they are interacting with is Fir'aun. And Fir'aun represents an external enemy, a perceptible enemy, an enemy that you can see, an enemy that you can easily identify, that tyrant that subjugated our people for, for many years. This is the main enemy in the pre-Exodus period. So the main antagonist in the pre-Exodus period is Fir'aun. Whereas after the Exodus, after the departure of Musa and Bani Israel from ancient Egypt, the main enemy is different. The main enemy is no longer an external enemy. The main enemy becomes what? The nafs. The hidden enemy is the self. And this is a major turning point. Now, many people might think that Bani Israel under Fir'aun was actually the greatest trial for them. However, when you look at it with a critical eye, you actually find that the trials and the tribulations that Bani Israel and Musa faced after Fir'aun were actually greater. Because they were related to battling, not against an external enemy, but it was a battle against the self. And therefore, when we reflect on this idea, the difference between an external enemy and an internal enemy, there are a few points that require some reflection. Number one is the idea that an, a hidden enemy is more dangerous than an external enemy. Fir'aun was easily recognizable. Whereas the self is subtle. The nafs is not perceptible to us. The nafs is very close. Our nafs is very lovable to us. It's very beloved to us. And that's why in a famous narration attributed to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, That the most dangerous enemy is not any external enemy. It wasn't Fir'aun, in fact. The most dangerous enemy is the soul, is yourself that rests between your shoulders. So, on one level, this, we see this shift from focusing on an external enemy like Fir'aun to now turning inward and focusing on a nafsul ammara the hidden enemy, the internal enemy. Another danger that is related to this idea of combating a hidden enemy is that the battle against Fir'aun was temporary. The battle against Fir'aun was not perpetual and ongoing. Fir'aun reigned for many, many years. However, the struggle against Fir'aun ultimately ended. And it ended with his destruction and death in the Red Sea. Whereas the struggle against the self is not something that ends. The self doesn't end. It doesn't have a finite period where it reigns. The struggle against the self is ongoing as long as you are in this world. 
So one of the differences between the external enemy and the internal enemy is number one, that the internal enemy is more dangerous because it's closer to you, because you cannot see it, it's imperceptible. And number two, it's ongoing, unlike the battle against the external enemy. It's an ongoing struggle. And that's why we see that the death of Fir'aun did not mark the end of trials and tribulations for Bani Israel. It was just replaced with another type of struggle. Now the struggle of the self always existed. But in the pre-Exodus period, the focal point was the battle against Fir'aun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the struggle against the self is ongoing. It's not going to end. You are never going to be left to yourself. Do you think that you're just going to say that I believe and you're not going to be tried and you're not going to be tested? So, <clears throat> this is a few points regarding the, the struggle against an internal enemy as opposed to an external enemy. So, and there's one more point that I want to mention. And it's that with Fir'aun, as believers who are struggling against Fir'aun, it's a win-win situation. Because if Fir'aun kills you while you are patiently enduring those hardships and you're holding on to your iman, you meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as a martyr. And if you are victorious in overcoming Fir'aun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will reward you for your struggle, for your patience. So with an external enemy, you don't really lose as long as you maintain your faith. Because either you are victorious or you are martyred. But with the struggle against the self, if you lose that battle against the self, it's not a win-win situation. It's a win-lose situation. With Fir'aun, it's win-win. If you are patient and you have faith, either you overthrow him, you defeat him, or he kills you. In both circumstances, you're, you're ahead. You're victorious. You're either rewarded for your patience, or you're given the crown of martyrdom. But with the self, if you fail in the battle against the self, then, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will punish you. You'll be held accountable. So one of the major differences between the story of Musa and Bani Israel before the death of Fir'aun and after the death of Fir'aun is that in the pre-Exodus period, the main enemy is an external enemy, Fir'aun. Whereas after the Exodus, the story shifts inward. The focus is more on battling and nafsul ammara. And this is what we find, my dear brothers and sisters, in our hadith literature. We have this concept of al jihadul akbar and jihadul asghar. Human beings, as human beings, we're always struggling against adversaries. We're always fighting against temptation. We're always enduring these trials and tribulations. There's a, there's a beautiful narration where Imam Jafar al-Sadiq, salawatullahi alayhi, he says, أَنَّ النَّبِي صَلَى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهِ وَآلِهِ بَعَثَ سَرِيَةً The Prophet صلى الله عليه وآله, he once sent an army. Sariya. And by the way, in the seerah of the Prophet, just for you know, your, your own benefit, the word Sariya refers to an army in which the Prophet appoints a military commander. A ghazwa is an army that is led by the Prophet. So that's why, for example, we call the Battle of Badr Ghazwat Bad, because the Prophet participated. The Prophet was the military commander in Badr, in Uhud. So these are known as the Ghazawat of the Prophet. Those battles and those armies that were led by the Prophet, 
they are referred to as ghazwa. Whereas if an army is assembled and the Prophet appoints someone else to lead, that's known as a sariya. So this hadith mentions that the Prophet ﷺ, he sent a military brigade. He sent an army to fight against some of the enemies of Islam. After some time, they returned. The Prophet ﷺ was welcoming them back to Medina. They were entering the city. Imam al-Sadiq says that the Prophet received them. And he said to them, Marhaban bi qawmin qadaw al jihad al asghar wa baqiya alayhim al jihad al akbar. Welcome, all the ones who have completed the minor jihad, the minor struggle. And what remains now for them is the major struggle. Now you have to understand, brothers and sisters, that these men. They've left their families for weeks maybe, maybe even months. They've endured hunger, they've traveled through the blazing hot deserts. They've exposed themselves to danger. They put their lives in danger. Some of them maybe were killed, others were wounded. They had to spend their own money in many cases to travel and to participate in these battles. They return and after all of this, the Prophet says, Alhamdulillah, the smaller mission you've completed. So naturally, what are they going to ask? Qila, Ya Rasulullah, if, the, if all of this was Jihadul Asghar, what is Jihadul Akbar? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa he famously replies, Jihadul Nafs. To struggle against the self, to struggle against the nafs. So when we go through the story, of Musa and Bani Israel, what we see in fact is with the death of Fir'aun, the lesser jihad has ended and the greater jihad is now going to begin. Because the battle against Fir'aun was what? Al Jihad al Asghar. And now, Jihad al-Akbar is going to begin. So, we're speaking now about the main differences between the pre-Exodus period and the post-Exodus period. And we said number one is that the enemy is now changing. The main antagonist in the pre-Exodus period is Fir'aun. After the exodus, after the drowning of Fir'aun, the main antagonist is what? It's the self. It's the nufus, the souls of the Israelites themselves. Now, the second main difference between Bani Israel before the drowning of Fir'aun and after is the nature and the purpose of their suffering. We know that Bani Israel suffered greatly under Fir'aun. But there was a higher purpose to their suffering. Their suffering and their hardship was not necessarily something that was negative. It was bitter, but there was an ultimate objective that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted them to achieve. If you look at the fifth ayah in Surah Al-Qasas, Surah 28, of the Quran, ayah number five. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the master plan. What is the ultimate goal for Bani Israel? What does he want the children of Israel to achieve? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, وَنُرِيدُ أَن نَمُنَّ عَلَى الَّذِينَ اسْتُضْعِفُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ أَئِمَّةً وَنَجْعَلَهُمْ الْوَارِثِينَ Allah says, we wish to confer a favor upon the oppressed. What is the favor that Allah wants to confer upon Bani Israel? He wants to make them a'imma. He wants to make them leaders. And He wants them to, in, to be the inheritors. He wants them to inherit the Holy Land. Meaning, 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to prepare Bani Israel for authority. He wants to prepare them for governance. He wants them to be the rulers of the Holy Land. But in order to prepare them for the great responsibility of leadership, of establishing the law of God, the most important lesson that they have to learn is what? The lesson of empathy. You have to be able to empathize with the suffering of people. So the purpose, one of the objectives, one of the wisdoms behind their suffering under Fir'aun was that they were supposed to learn that we should not oppress others because we tasted the bitterness of oppression. We should look after the oppressed because there was a time when no one looked after us. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted them to go through this trial so that when Allah gives them power and authority, they will not treat their subjects the way that Fir'aun treated his subjects. But unfortunately, as history shows us, that this lesson was not learned. So the suffering of the Israelites under Fir'aun had a purpose. There was a wisdom behind it. Now, the Qur'an tells us that Bani Israel also suffered after the drowning of Fir'aun. They faced many difficulties. They faced many hardships. However, the reason behind their suffering after the exodus was different. Under Fir'aun, they were being primed and prepared to be leaders. Allah wanted them to, de to develop empathy. But the suffering that they experienced after they were rescued was a result of their moral indiscretions. It was a result of their sins. It was a result of their own iniquities. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 61, He says, وَضُرِبَتْ عَلَيْهِمُ الذِّلَّةُ وَالْمَسْكَنَ وَبَاعُوا بِغَضَبٍ مِّنَ اللَّهِ They were struck with humiliation and poverty and they incurred the wrath of Allah. Why? ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ يَكْفُرُونَ بِآيَاتِ اللَّهِ Meaning that this suffering that happened after they were rescued was the result of their own deeds because they rejected the signs of God. And they started to murder the prophets. I mean, talk about not learning the lesson. You were being persecuted by Fir'aun. Instead, instead of developing empathy for the oppressed, you yourselves have become the oppressors. And you're committing oppression against who? Not ordinary people. You are committing zulm and oppression against the prophets. And this is because of their sins. And this is because of their constant transgressing of the boundaries of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, which we will discuss in our subsequent lectures. So, I've mentioned so far two main differences between the pre-Exodus period and the post-Exodus period. Number one, the enemy, the focus of the enemy has changed. The main enemy is now an internal enemy after the Exodus. Fir'aun was the main antagonist. Now, it's all about an nafsul ammar Number two, the reason for their suffering is different. In Egypt, they were suffering as a preparation for them to inherit the Holy Land and to act as a'imma, to be leaders. But after they were rescued, their suffering was self-inflicted. It was the result of their sins, their iniquities, their transgression against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
Number three, the third main difference between the pre-Exodus and the post-Exodus periods is that when you look at the ayat of the Qur'an that speak about Musa and Fir'aun and Bani Israel and Fir'aun, you'll notice that they are generally Meccan verses. The ayat that speak about the showdown between Musa and Fir'aun and the suffering of Bani Israel under Fir'aun, they were revealed in Mecca. Why? Because this aspect of the story, this period of the Musawi narrative, serves as a consolation to the Prophet and to the early Muslims. There are many parallels here. Musa was going up against Fir'aun, who was the superpower of his time. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi is going up against Quraysh. And they are basically like the pharaohs of the time. He's going against the power structures of the time. Bani Israel is suffering under Fir'aun. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Muslims that you're not the only ones who experienced persecution because of their faith. Recall the suffering of Bani Israel under Fir'aun to give you strength. And they all know how the story ends. The story ends with what? Ultimately, your enemy will be subdued and you will be released from this oppression. So therefore, the exodus becomes very similar to the hijrah of the Prophet So in the same way, Bani Israel was rescued from the tyranny of Fir'aun, the Prophet and the early Muslims, they were rescued through the barakah of the hijrah from Mecca to Yathrib. So those Qur'anic verses that speak about Musa and Bani Israel and their struggles of, against Fir'aun, they were revealed in Mecca as consolation, to give sabr to the Muslims. However, you see that those verses that speak about what transpired after the drowning of Fir'aun were revealed in Medina. And there's a reason behind this. Because after Musa saves Bani Israel from the shackles of Pharaoh, now they have their own religious identity. Now Musa has to build a community. Similarly, the Prophet ﷺ, when he escapes Mecca and he settles in Medina, he has to do exactly what Musa did. He has to establish a community. So the story of Musa and Bani Israel after the drowning of Pharaoh serves as a warning to the Muslims that now, because in Medina, there are three powerful Jewish tribes that are in Medina. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, through these stories, He wants to give the Muslims some education about the religious history of these people. So you can remain vigilant and cautious. Meaning these people, they betrayed Musa. You have to be careful with them. You have to be cautious. They have a history, history of betrayal against their prophets. Don't be naive. Be vigilant. Be cautious. That's number one. Number two, and more importantly, the verses about the challenges and the struggles and the mistakes of Bani Israel after they were rescued serves as a warning to the Muslims that be careful. Do not make the, the same mistakes as Bani Israel. Do not treat Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi the same way that Bani Israel treated Musa.
You have to be cautious. Because don't think that you are the chosen ones. They were also chosen, but they failed. And yes, you have been honored by the fact that you are the Sahaba of the Prophet, that you embraced Islam, but you're going to be tested. And don't fall from grace in the same way that the Israelites fell from grace. And I'll conclude with this, my dear brothers and sisters. There's a hadith, a famous hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And this is a hadith that is recorded in both Sunni and Shi'i hadith sources. The narration is reported by Abu Sa'id al-Khudri. He's one of the prominent companions of the Prophet. He says that the Prophet once said, he was addressing the Muslims, he was addressing the companions. He says, sunana man qablakum shibran bishibr wa The Prophet says to the Muslims that you will follow in the footsteps of the past generations, inch by inch. You will imitate them so much so that if they were to have gone, and this is kind of a figurative way of saying, if they went into a lizard hole, you're, you're also going to go into a lizard hole. Meaning that you are going to follow their footsteps. The bad news is that many of you will make the same mistakes as Bani Israel. So they ask the Prophet that, Ya Rasulullah, who are you referring to when you speak about those who came before us? Are you speaking about the Jews and the Christians? And the Prophet says, who else would I be referring to? So this hadith highlights that the Muslims are not unique in the sense that they are immune from these tests. They're immune from these trials. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to test the companions of the Prophet and the Muslims in the same way that he tested Bani Israel. So as we go through this series, my dear brothers and sisters, I want you, and I will assist you in doing this, I want you to draw, connect the dots. I want you to draw the parallels. I don't want you to go through this series as just an interesting discussion of, about the history of Bani Israel. I want you to look at yourself as potentially like them. Because many of the hardships that they face was a result of them failing against the battle against themselves. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless us and to guide us and to illuminate our hearts with the teachings of Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad. Wa akhir da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa sallallahu ala sayyidina wa nabina Muhammad wa ala ahli baytihi al-tayyibin al-tahirin. Allahumma sallam.